today, I will talk about the concept of metaphysical qualities, which was uh, developed by Roman Ingarden. And uh, as you will all know, the exploration of Ingarden's aesthetics and the connection with his with ontology is no longer an uncharted area for research. However, notable gaps still persist. And um, in particular, some harmonies between uh, ontologically, uh, ontological and aesthetic elements remain partly unexplored. With this in mind, I would like today to examine a series of, of ontological concepts which are connected to uh, the idea of metaphysical equality. Okay. This is the structure of my talk, which, uh, which is divided in four brief sections. And uh, these are the main steps of Fingarden's uh, life and work. So my whole talk is uh, revolves around the basic question, which is uh, how do we get to know ourselves and how do we be become familiar with our own life? And uh, one basic uh, slash simple answer may be through art. But why happen happens this? So what is our life? How is it structured? And what is the word and how is it structured for us to be able to better understand the course of our life through art? First section, existence and metaphysical qualities. The, the proposed itinerary does not commence within the fictional universe crafted by the artist, but uh, instead we start in the real and temporal world of human existence. And this existence, uh, according to Ingarden, is marked by a, by a succession of events, a series of events that leave, uh, that leave significant imprints on the human beings and are responsible for the modification and increase of their essential endowment. Among the events experienced by human beings, there are certain specific events which are capable of manifesting or revealing uh, metaphysical qualities. And I quote, in our usual everyday life, oriented on small practical ends and their realization, life flows by, if one may say so, senselessly, gray and meaningless with no regard for the, for the great works which might be realized in this end-like existence. And then comes a day like a grace, when perhaps for reasons that are unmarkable and unnoticed, and usually also concealed, an event occurs which envelops us and our surroundings in just such an indescribable atmosphere. Whatever the particular quality of this atmosphere, whether it is frightening or enchanting to distraction, it distinguishes itself like a shining, colorful splendor from the everyday grayness of the days. So there are some events in human life that stands out in contrast to the grayness of life. And um, these events are namely those who manifest, those that manifest a metaphysical quality. This metaphysical quality, so, is linked to a specific event and is kind of um, an atmospheric quality, okay? Um, in, in what follows, I will uh, delve into the status of these metaphysical qualities and the role that they play in both the tangible cosmos of the real world and the purely intentional realm of art and artistic products. Through the prism of such qualities, the relationship between these two domains, so reality and art, is scrutinized and including the reciprocal contributions each domain make to the constitution of the other. Specifically, my analysis will explore the influence of metaphysical equality in shaping the identity of the real subject and in the possibility for this precise subject to fully comprehend and elaborate the most decisive elements and moments and the fundamental terms of their life. There is uh, probably the most precise definition of these qualities is, and I quote, that there are simple or derived qualities, essences. Uh, to be honest, the uh, essences is wrong. It's a wrong uh, translation because it should be essentialities, however. Derived qualities, essentialities, as for example, the sublime, the tragic, the dreadful, the shocking, the inexplicable, the demonic, the holy, the sinful, the sorrowful, the indescribable brightness of good fortune, as well as the grotesque, the charming, the light, the peaceful, etc. These qualities are not properties of objects in the usual sense of the term, 
nor are they in general features of some psychic state. But instead, they are usually revealed in complex and often very disparate situations or, of, or events as an atmosphere which, hovering over the man and the things containing these situations, penetrates and illumines everything with its light. So from this quotation, some elements need to be highlighted. First and foremost, these qualities are described as neither objective characteristics nor psychic conditions or tones or psychic tones. So they are, they do not adhere to an object as its properties. And they have, let's say, a very peculiar or unique bearer, which is an event or a situation. So a rightness or situation. Another element that requires emphasis is the fundamental role played by these events that manifest metaphysical qualities in the existence. And its importance is independent, on the, um, independent on, uh, of the positivity or negativity of the quality in question. Whether it is demonic or angelic, in any case, the event carrying a metaphysical quality will have a positive that is meaningful value for us. This meaningfulness is rooted in the ability to disclose the depths of being. Whatever the particular nature of these qualities, writes in Garden, they are also characterized by the fact that they reveal a deeper sense of life and existence in general, and what is more, by the fact that they themselves constitute this usually hidden sense. Mm -hmm. When we see them, the depths and primal sources of existence to which we are usually blind and which we hardly see in our daily lives are revealed. So in Garden is discussing qualities. Um, he's talking about qualities that by making the person aware of the depths of being, radically modify them and their future. He also says that a secret longing for the concrete revelation of metaphysical qualities lives in us and drives us throughout our entire life. And here you have two more quotations that I'm not gonna read that talk about this secret and lifelong longing. Uh, uh, not again at the end of section one, we are still dealing with our own experiences, so we are not uh, talking art at the moment. Section two, metaphysical qualities and metaphysics. The, the designation for the term metaphysical qualities is rather curious, as, as both terms have a highly technical meaning in Ingarden's ontology, which at first glance seems to diverge from the description just read. So why are these qualities termed metaphysical? And this is a problem that has uh, been a problem for many scholars. Technical, technically speaking, metaphysics is defined by Engarden as the science of what factually exists. Distinguishing within it what is essential, within what exists, what is essential to existing entities from what is not. As a discipline directed toward factual reality, metaphysics is distinct from, distinct from ontology, which is an a priori investigation of pure possibilities. By its ability to discern the essential, moreover, metaphysics differs from the natural sciences, which deal with, with the entire entity, assuming it in its full contingency. Unfortunately, this scientific disciplinary characterization seems to poorly align with metaphysical qualities, and the quotes introduced above whose tone appears to lean toward a more nuanced, vague, and existentially toned understanding of the term metaphysics. In my opinion, this theoretical knot can only be untangled by considering further elaborations of the definition of metaphysics disseminated in Ingarden's ontological texts. Following this path, uh, we find that the adjective metaphysical um, seems to be attributable to two aspects of metaphysical qualities, namely, their domain and their mode of givenness. Regarding their domain, uh, metaphysical qualities are metaphysical as they refer to the totality of being, a problematic realm that belongs to the metaphysical science. The second aspect, and the, more, um, the most interesting in my opinion, for which metaphysical qualities are termed as such, is based on their mode of givenness. As established by the previously cited quotation, metaphysical qualities reveal themselves in connection with events that occur as if by grace. The realization, writes in Garden, is, as we have phrased it, a grace. This is not to say that they are realized and manifested suddenly and without cause, or they are given, for example, in a mythological or religious sense. 
This is only to establish the simple fact that we cannot evoke deliberately for their own sake the situations or experiences in which these metaphysical qualities are realized. And it is precisely when we're awaiting and designing their realization and the opportunity to behold them that they do not appear. It is not feasible to delve uh, now into the distinction between ontology and metaphysics, nor the concept of reason and rationality that arises from Ingarden's philosophical framework. On a programmatic level, let's say, metaphysics, as I already said, operates with the material that ontology provides and uh, ultimately derived through the composition from, uh, of the content of ideas. However, there are other references to metaphysics in which it is in which in garden presented not only as a validation of what um, exists in reality in accordance with ontology but also as an acknowledgement of elements pre present in the configuration of an entity whose existence is not deducible a priori so of aspects that cannot be described in terms of the laws of essence in this sense metaphysics constitutes the realm where reason in uh, transcends being barely the site of a priori rationality and it becomes the domain of acceptance for elements that are not governable and appears or exist as if by these are three um, very short quotation as if by grace as fully contingent as real metaphysical history. In this sense, metaphysical qualities are metaphysical in the face of their unpredictability, while endowed with a cause, they are not predictable and imaginable in their realization. Connected to this complex ontology of metaphysical, uh, metaphysical qualities and their mode of givenness, there is a specific epistemology of metaphysical qualities. And I quote, in their unique form, they, so metaphysical quality, do not allow purely rational determination and they cannot be grasped. Instead, they merely allow themselves to be simply ecstatically seen in the determinate situations in which they are realized. Moreover, they are perceivable in their specific, simply incomparable and indescribable uniqueness, only when we ourselves live primarily in the given situation. Even in the case of other essentialities and in any epistemological process of consciousness, essentiality is grasped to, through a vision. What appears to distinguish metaphysical qualities is that in this case, there is not an intuitive vision, but an ecstatic vision. In this state, the subject, instead of merely grasping and apprehending a feature of the encountered objectivity, is trapped by an event itself. This ecstatic experience of metaphysical qualities, uh, of metaphysical quality, as I already said, plays a fundamental role in human life and in the process of shaping our own lives. However, a process arises in relation to the context of their manifestation and to this epistemology of metaphysical qualities. In real life, writes in Garden, situations in which metaphysical qualities are realized are relatively quite rare. Moreover, their realization affects us too strongly for us to experience fully the totality of their contents. There is a secret longing in us for their realization and contemplation, but when the moment that they become real arrives, their realization, or better, they themselves in their own countenance, become too powerful for us. They grip us and over overpower us. We do not have the strength and we do not have the time, as it were, to lose ourselves in contemplation. So the contemplation of qualities that indeed exist in real life and are what most the side of the terms of life is hindered. So now I will attempt to explore the root of this impossibility, examining whether it is a de jure or de facto incapacity and whether it is rooted in our deficiency, so a part subjecti, in the structure of the real world, so a part objecti, or a combination, or in a combination of both aspects. Section three, time and events. So first of all, uh, let us turn to the temporal dilemma. So we do not have the time, but what is this time that we lack or do not have? What is the time at our disposal? And above all, what is the time in which that transformative event occur, aiming to radically change the human being and to re reveal them the ultimate depths of being? In the controversy over the existence of the world, in Garden uh, says that says that in the real world we have three different types of objectualities. So we have autonomous object, which endures through time, events, and processes. 
um, the, events in, the event in particular is defined as the occurrence more precisely the coming into being of some state of affairs or of some object involved in situation. So with the term event, we are not isolating a complex process with multiple phases, but the momentary happening of something. Now, these three types of objectualities have different characteristics, and in particular, they, have, um, they are considered temporal in different ways. All three types are temporal, but the real object and the process endure through time, whereas the events occur, meaning they come into being and precisely there, which cease to exist. So events uh, are instantaneous and they vanish upon their appearance in their momentary nature. Events might seem alien to the temporal fabric of the world. However, Ingarden asserts that it is precisely in this instantaneous temporality that being expresses itself fully. Incapable of narrating the temporal plot of the real world, events, according to Ingarden, can reveal the actuality that defines the present. With the term actualitas, in garden denotes a, di a dimension of super effectivity and fullness of existence. The fullness of being in inactuous in inactuesse thus grants the present an advantage over the past and the future, given that the present is the, the, the place for, for the event itself. So because events exist only in present, they bear the uniqueness of, the, uh, of these moments and are thus characterized by actuality. It is noteworthy how in Garden underscores the temporal nature of the event, especially in light of its instantaneous dimension. The absence of duration in the event does not entirely negate its temporal determinateness. Each moment is infused with the singularity that defines it, as object and time are not disconnected entities. Among the series of events acting as atomic elements constituting the temporal fabric of the world, where multiple and during real objects intersect, there are, there are also the specific events that manifest metaphysical quality. In these events, the subject undergoes a radical modification direct in their existence and structure. While these metaphysical events share instantaneous temporality with every other event, they nevertheless carry an increase in actuality. Section four, art and metaphysical qualities. Now let us turn our attention to the consideration of the work of art, which is beckoned and summoned from the quasi nothingness to which it belongs to engage with the real world and enable humans to experience the significant moments of their existence in the serene contemplation of their significance. The literary work of art, writes in Garden, attains its high point in the manifestation of metaphysical quality. The uniquely artistic, however, is based upon the manner of this manifestation of the literary work of art. Particularly, the manifestation of metaphysical qualities occurs in the fourth and final stratum of the literary work that of represented objectivities. The manifestation of metaphysical qualities, however, doesn't occur solely in the layer of represented objectivities, but arises from the synergistic action of the different strata of the work. It is crucial to note that the work does not merely represent metaphysical qualities, does not talk about a given metaphysical quality, but rather represents a work that through revealing metaphysical quality expresses these qualities. Hence, there is a change, change in the bearer, so we do not have an event, but a work which expresses a metaphysical quality. Now we must turn to the two problematic aspects of the um, manifestation of metaphysical qualities to examine whether and how the manner of their manifestation in the literary work of art compensates for the difficulties of the event, for the you know, difficult peculiarities of the event, and provides the subject with a different mode of access to metaphysical qualities. First, uh, it was mentioned that the event in which the metaphysical quality occurs is too powerful, also mystic, for the tranquility required for contemplation to take place. This element, this element is compensated for by the weakness of the literary work as a purely intentional entity. It exploits its being quasi nothing, devoid of real spatiality, temporality, and inherent properties. In Garden writes, precisely that which, from an ontological point of view, 
constitutes a shortcoming and efficiency of represented objectivities, namely that they do not have a real but only an intentional ontically heteronomous mode of existence, and that in their content they only feign a habitus of reality, enables them to manifest metaphysical qualities in a manner that is peculiar to the work of art. Their ontic heteronomy, however, enables us to contemplate them relatively calmly. Calmly, since in this concretization they do not have the richness and power that they attain in full realization. The fact that they are concretized only to the extent required for their manifestation still allows a certain calmness in apprehending them and a distance. The key to the path we are exploring lies in regarding the specific definition of the concept of distance, which is not to be understood as personal detachment from the material identity, but it derives uh, from the unique phenomenon of not belonging to the same world, so real and pure intention. So artistic experiences which enter into our real life in a quite remarkable way and become interwoven with our life, um, are not ours in a true sense. The price to pay for this contemplation is a lesser decisiveness for the life of the individual. Writes in Garden, he says that real life is much stronger and, in the, and it demands its rights. In other words, if it is indeed the distance from the qualities that allows for their contemplation, it is equally true that this distance prevents them from exerting the influence, the ecstasy, uh, that real metaphysical qualities cause. For this reason, with the transition from real life to aesthetic reading and contemplation, ecstatic vision transforms into catharsis, as noted by Ingarden in a footnote. Purification or purgation is possible precisely because the manifestation, the bone of manifestation, is diminished. Regarding temporality, metaphysical qualities are not. Um, are not inherent properties of objects, but rather characterization of events. They live within the existence of the events, so, experience, so they experience its appearance and immediate disappearance. Therefore, the question arises, why is a work of art capable of representing metaphysical quality, qualities facilitating their contemplation? And what role does time play in ensuring this possibility? The work of art adopts uh, a time or creates a time which is analogous to the concrete time of the real world. However, with the transition to the represented time, so the time of the work of art, the primacy of the present is eliminated. The elimination of the present uh, happens not in the perspective of an extension of the fractured present, of the extension of the present, but rather in the dimension of an alignment of the three uh, temporal dimensions, so past, present, and future. Now let us stop for a minute and conclude, in conclusion and um, look a bit at the itinerary that we did. The proposed itinerary has undertaken a particular operation. So rather than aligning with Garden's project to demonstrate to Ustel and contra Ustel that the intentional and purely intentional object is radically different from the real object. I try to underline that these two words are meant to engage in a dialogue with the perspective of mutual influence and reciprocal definition. In this sense, Ingarden not only asserts that the work of art is entirely indebted to the real world in its physical foundation and properties, but also demonstrates how the real world needs if not for its definition, at least for the construction of the personal identity of the subject and the possibility for the subject to um, really and fully experience the terms of, of um, their own life, a relationship with the cosmos of purely intentional entities. Furthermore, it has been seen that it is not only about the incarnation of, of values as a morally supreme work but also about the necessity of contemplating certain metaphysical qualities to take possession of one's essence and to disclose the structural relationship that binds the human being to the totality of being. To carry out this fundamental supportive activity, purely intentional objectivity is called upon not only to represent the real world and provide a mere copy, nor to lay bare the mysteries of being to the reader. Rather, it must construct a world that manifests a specific metaphysical quality 
revealing itself only within individual life. In order to reveal, uh, to, to express metaphysical qualities, the work of art must, however, shift the focus from these, property, from these properties, translating them from the event to the world. In doing so, it allows humans to contemplate what is most decided in their lives by providing time to what is structurally instantaneous and tangible. However, the transposition of metaphysical qualities from the event to the world, um, with this transposition, the work of art also mitigates their force, necessarily relinquishing the actuality that characterizes the moment. So we have illuminated an essential element of Ingarden's temporality, unjustly forgotten by critics. Although literary time is a mere modification, a deceptive analogy of real time, it compensates for the deficiencies and peculiarities of that real, concrete, and phenomenal time in which the subject truly lives. In doing so, Ingarden doesn't delegate solely to science the construction of a time tunnel that can bear our reflection on it, but instead he entrusts artistic creation with the task of delivering a measurable and yet simultaneously concrete, qualitatively determined time. Thank you very much. If I have, Tom, do I have uh, other one, two minutes? I don't know if I'm... You, you, you could have them. I think we, we would have about 10 minutes for discussion now. So if you want to add, like, yeah, just go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, I just wanted to say something about the photos in the slides, uh, we, which are a bit uh, homogeneous. I don't know if you saw it and are all by this uh, Italian photographer, which is Giovanni Caramonte. Um, I wanted to say this, not because he's a friend of mine, but rather because uh, it's uh, um, poetics and his text about, um, about photography are full of um, thoughts, which really uh, reflects all the passages that in garden uh, make about metaphysical qualities. And um, yeah, maybe I will just very uh, fast read this, this quotation. Every view, even that of the most desolate and insignificant province of global banalization, can take on the luminous aspect of an unexpected event and can transform into the splendor of an action over which no power of possession can be claimed and on which no form of definitive knowledge can be exerted. Every view is an image, and as such, in the representable proximity of everything that surrounds us, it maintains the immense and boundless presence of totality, the evidence of a mystery that appears in it and through it becomes visible. When the focus is tuned to the sign of the infinite, even photography rediscovers its ability to traverse every hidden depth of reality, and I can call the part of my photography the name of infinite realism. And this is, mm, yeah, this one is. It's okay.